Hello, everyone. Welcome to day 30 of the 75 Days of Partition series. This is Gunita, and I am speaking to you from the 1947 Partition Archive. I'm co-hosting this series together uh, with Aprajita Dagar, who you may have seen if you've been watching us for the last few days. Sonam Kalra will also be making an appearance as a co-host, and Noor Chabla, uh, both of our former hosts for the Sunday Story Live uh, series. So 75 Days of Partition kicked off about a month ago on June 3rd, uh, which is the day that the Mountbatten plan was announced. And it's going to end 75 days later on August 17th when the Radcliffe line was announced. So today I'm doing a session with Fahad. Um, so hopefully we can get Fahad. Hello. Fahad. <laughs> and Fahad, as you know, has been joining us roughly once a week to give us a background uh, and understanding of what was going on via newspaper cuttings from that time period. Um, so welcome, Fahad. Uh, so Fahad, what do you have going for us today? So this week we'll cover from 27 June to 30th June. Okay. And I'll just run you through the happenings on day-to-day -day basis from the newspaper clippings. Um, can you just put the presentation on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. So Anshul, can we get the presentation on the screen? Uh, yeah. So on 20th, 27 June, so finally the draft bill that the India Independence, which we now know as the India Independence Act, that bill was finalized and it was to be wired to the Viceroy in about a week from 27 June. So roughly it would reach the Viceroy by 3rd July and on 4th or 5th July, he would have attended the meeting with the Indian leaders to tell them about, oh, this is what's going to happen. This is the India Independence Act and this, this is going to be enacted on August 15th. So initially, the what the discussion was in the prior weeks before this was whether they, they, they want to have two independence bills, each for like India and Pakistan or just one. The then Prime Minister Clement Attlee, he just wanted it to happen like really quickly and get it through the parliament really quickly. So he just opted for one bill. That is the India Independence Act, which would partition the country into two and give them both the dominions independent status. And what we had seen also in the past few weeks that a lot of states were hesitant in joining either the Indian Dominion or the Pakistan Dominion. They wanted to be under the British crown only. But since the British had given up their paramountcy, they had to join either India or Pakistan. And uh, states like Travancore and Hyderabad were still not still wanted to be independent. They didn't want to join either. But here we see uh, on the left hand of the screen, uh, roughly 54 million people, that is like uh, 14, I think 14 of the states, 40, sorry, not 14, 40. 40 states had already given their assent, uh, assent for joining either India or Pakistan. And that formed roughly 54 million people. And this was the basis that uh, both the dominions of India and Pakistan later used to pressurize other states into joining the constituent assemblies. Yeah, can you? Yes, Thank you. Oh, wait. Yeah. Here we also see that uh, the state congress committee and all the leaders just saying that rulers are not competent to de decide Hyderabad's future because Hyderabad also wanted to stay independent. And a year later, we also see then the Indian army storms into Hyderabad and the Operation Polo takes place and uh, Hyderabad is uh, uh, is brought under into the fold of the Indian dominion. But uh, people, uh, what the Indian Congress, uh, state Congress claimed was that the people wanted to be with India. It's just the Nizam who didn't want, who just wanted independence. So th that's how they sort of delegitimized his claim of independence by saying that's not what the people want. People need people's mandate and that's why you need to join the Indian uh, Constituent Assembly. Here on the uh, right hand of the screen, we see um, how are things that shaping in East Bengal. So both both parts of the Bengal, East Bengal and West Bengal, they had seen a spurt of violence, uh, which which was going on since March, but it in, in the middle of the June, it sort of it stemmed a little because the government was a little proactive in dealing with it. But again, it started after when the Bengal partition was finalized, when, when it was final that Bengal would be partitioned across communal lines. So here we see women from the communities that were taken by women, by the men from the opposite communities. And we also see here the double burden of violence that falls on women. 
one is the people from the men from the other community target these women to damage or what the so called honor of the society but also the people from the same community kill off their women to stop that from happening from that honor getting marred so that's how the women women face the double burden of violence uh if we this is in bring all yeah this, this was in bengal east bengal more like this is something we don't often hear about because we hear about a lot of the violence against women in punjab in the popular <laughs> sort of narrative of yeah. partition but it was it also happened in east bengal uh right. and west bengal also both so here we see uh, there's a side by side cutting that i have pasted that violence was happening in La- lahore where it was muslim dominated area and kanpur where it was hindu dominated area and um, it's just senseless violence that took place day after day and after a point even in the newspapers it didn't you know it didn't feature as a headline um, it's just in page 3 or 4 that i found this that two men are stabbed 40 people killed riots happening every day section 144 imposed so even even that violence took you know took a back seat and you know it was just portrayed as a small cutting in page 3 or 4 it happened so de- so regularly that it didn't find any space in the front page of the newspapers um mm-hmm. on the right hand side what we see is uh, that's really railway- sorry that's yeah. a really striking observation that it was it was becoming so normalized that it was not appearing even on the front page that's really telling of the time that's an interesting mm-hmm. observation um so on the right hand side of the screen we see uh, the railway strikers and how it turned it didn't t- turn violent they were just like the police open fired and one of them was killed so the rioting uh, sorry not the rioting the protest the railway strike was that happened was because of the industries act the industry dispute act which was passed in the 1947 march and they were uh, striking for two things for one that the payment should be increased and the second was the repeal of this industries dispute act which was in 1947 which was recently in 2020 it got repealed and it was in uh, 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 the the thing that they were uh, mostly against was this act did not allow them to directly go to courts if the employers were uh, you know if they showed high hand in or something so this act advocated more like arbitration reconciliation and those sort of things and also regulated how to strike and how to protest so this is what they were fighting to repeal mm. and uh, here we see 17700 workers you know paralyzing the total traffic of bombay they came out on streets and completely paralyzed traffic and that's why the police uh, we see open firing on them uh, and um, here we see uh, jay prakash narayan uh, he was one of the socialist leaders of the country and he was a advocate of mazdoor raj what uh, and he said that what that won't be happening if um, only the peasants he he didn't only wanted to unite peasants but also across the industries the manufacturing industries also so here he wanted a nationalization of mines so that a, a single union would be formed but at that time there were many many sort of unions that existed uh, for workers that were working in mines and they were at conflicting they had conflicting interests or like different interests than each other uh, what he wanted was nationalization so that it would be easier for people to unite across uh, across um, economic lines and then um, a mazdu a true mazdoor raj would be possible which was um, which in english can be translated roughly to people's mandate and he thought that if the only the leaders they the leaders of congress or muslim league they are not the true representative the people themselves are the true representatives so he he wanted a multi party that's really fascinating yeah um, i'm sorry where was that again could you uh, tell us the location uh here it was jharia where's that i i think jharia is uh, near what united provinces what was the united provinces uh so here we see uh, 29 now we finished 28 june we are on to 29 june what happened on 29 june so uh the headlines was of the newspaper mass struggle and travancore state was imminent this is something that the congress party was claiming the state leader of the congress party at that time that uh, even the travancore ruler did not had people's mandate and by not joining the indian dominion they were 
making the people resentful towards the government and they they will have a mass struggle if though they said it would be a non violent mass struggle and but they did organize and um it wasn't as non violent as they would have preferred uh but mm-hmm. at the same time there were other states like travancore and hyderabad were adamant the governments would not to join the union uh, the dominions at all but there were also states like kuch bihar even though kuch bihar a few weeks ago they also didn't want to but they also realized that people do want a unified india and that's that's what they went with later the they they did not have to undergo a, a military coup or that sort of thing to be brought under the fold of india um here we have um, khan abdul ghafar khan of the north uh, western frontier of pakistan sort of negotiating with jinnah saying that we will the we will either establish pathanistan and if that's not on the cards then the only way that they are going to join pakistan would be if the constitution would be favorable to the people of north western frontier of pakistan favorable as in it would enshrine the principles that the people of the frontier believe in Very interesting. And, uh, yeah. Because a while ago you were talking about them, uh, people wanting an independent state on the frontier. Yeah, yeah. So the, they wanted an independent state of Pakistan, but as the time progresses, as the weeks go on, they also realize that that is not something that's that would be possible. So they tried to negotiate after that, and um, then the, the Pakistan had British support to get into northwestern frontier of Pakistan. And Khan Abdul Ghafar Khan says that support is because uh, they want to make a military base there so that Russian invasion could be stopped or British can launch into Russia via Afghanistan easily. So that's what he accuses them of, to using the uh, northwestern uh, frontier land as a military base. and that's why he was against the move so much that's why he wanted an independent pakistan and here on the right hand side you could see he says the seed for the third world war the frontier leader added had already been sown so he thought of it as oh because if russia and britain would even the british military base would have a common border that is going to spark a third world third world war that's that it. is very fascinating so he's talking about the frontier being a british border and yeah. uh, afghanistan being more of a russian yeah Order. exactly fascinating so uh this is a picture of when uh, finally the punjab partition was finalized on the communal lines and this is right before the committee was formed uh to demarcate the two punjabs uh here we can see uh, the joint session of both of the people uh, of the people from uh, congress as well as muslim league and they are the, one of the final sessions and they were adopting the punjab partition decision here the faces are really blurry so i couldn't make out who all here are but the the text of the image mentions there was uh, bheem sen sachar of the congress and there was diwan bahadur sp singh so and do we have the muslim league present there as well yeah because it was a joint session so they should be there but the names are not written so i but i it's the photo quality is not so good so i can't make out the faces and are the people from the unionist party i think at this point it's been dissolved right yes so uh, but it it was a joint session so muslim league definitely should be there and also uh, akalis interesting yeah um and uh, here the, it's very it's i i found very fascinating how the government of uh, east bengal uh, they and the calcutta also they say uh, they said that the divorce and suicide rates in east bengal are spiking suicides i can still understand but divorce not really uh uh because of the starvation that the famine has caused i can and, divorce can make sense they can cause a lot of um you know conflict in families when there's yes. lack of resources when there's starvation but i think what they mean here by divorce is like something uh, the proper when you go through the government not just separation mm-hmm. finalized divorce in uh by going through the rigmarole of the judiciary and everything so in, someone should yeah, explore that right yeah. where their divorce is actually happening <laughs> yeah and in times of famine and communal violence uh, it would be really hard for people to you know follow the legal procedure to get a complete divorce so th- that's the only thing i found fascinating separation i definitely i can understand but th- they were using the word divorce and also the, uh, the the partition of india would also mean the partition of the cultural heritage as well as the archives and the 
archae the what was the archae archaeological survey of india um here we can see on the right hand side that they they're facing a lot of problems with the archives because all all of the records were like interconnected and how would you give half of it to india and half of it to pakistan and the researchers wouldn't be able to make sense of it when one was in one country and the other one the other part of that was in another country so uh, they decided finally to make photocopies and send it to both the countries uh, but that did not happen to the uh, archaeological survey of india because they were focused more on the taksila region where they had also formed a school of archaeology which went to pakistan and of course the uh, the harappan sites of mohin mohenjodaro they also went to pakistan and in the pakistani museum lahore museum we also have like um, statues of shiva and so the division the division of cultural heritage was not really communal in that sense because even the pakistan which was based on which was founded on the principle that it would belong to only muslims it also had in the museum the cultural heritage that would that is more hindu in nature um yeah so uh earlier in my in my earlier one of the sessions uh i had mentioned in one of those clippings there was that the east punjab capital would be delhi because east punjab did not have much of an infrastructure at that time delhi had broadcasting station delhi had colleges and so delhi should be made the capital of east punjab and the india's capital should be allahabad because it would it would be in the literally like in the center of india and every union territory or everything would be close by but later delhi didn't work out for punjab and simla was sort of posed as the next possible candidate for being the capital of east punjab fascinating yeah it would be uh, interesting to see how we ended up at chandigarh eventually yeah exactly um and then this is this is this is the last one of the last days that i have on this today for till 30th june and here we see molana abul kalam azad he was just pleading the minorities of india and pakistan uh, pleading to the uh, minorities of india and pakistan and he just wanted to pass a human rights charter for minorities in both the co constituent assemblies of countries uh, so that their the rights of the minorities could be secured and what he pleaded to them was that please do not migrate in large um in large swathes because this is a uh, one it's very dangerous and two you shouldn't leave your homeland instead the leaders of the land should make do everything in their power to make it safer for you so that was his plea so can i say something about i mean obviously he's not here to hear me but that seems to be a huge disconnect between what was actually happening yeah. and what they're saying so they're saying don't move but people didn't have a choice like exactly. 99% of the people moved because they were driven out by mobs Yes, that part seems to be missing from the uh, all, understanding of the leaders. Yes, almost all the readers were saying this because this was an administrative hassle. See, on the just on the right, I just put that clipping for that very reason. Influx of seventy thousand refugees in UP arrangements for help, and just before, uh, just uh, below that is most of the incomers were financially sound. So even the people who were able to leave first. they had some sort of financial capital as well as social capital because they were able to settle in these places even in delhi people who settled in eventually they had social capital so they were able to make a make a good living and make uh, sort of build uh, they, they became entrepreneurs um, a lot of shops that we see in khan market belong to partition survivors who came from pakistan um and these were just administrative hassles and they just at this point wanted people who could provide something so they wanted rich survivors a and second even uh, they were not able to get most of most of the survivors they were not rich most of like really poor they just left without anything on their they wanted course. educated survivors yeah. who could actually contribute um yeah. and do something constructive that. is what they you know okay they, they wanted that and um, otherwise it was because large scale migration was happening and of course that would uh, that would come along with uh, looting and that sort of because these people did not have any, anything to eat or anything and it's just uh, and it happens world over whenever large sort of migrations happen it does come with a little bit of violence and looting and whatever we consider uh, unlawful yeah, breakdown of law and order it's a total breakdown of law yeah. and order so um it's expected i mean if if you take away the police and military in 
New York City today, what's going to happen, right? You yeah. don't even need a partition and you'll have looting and mayhem. So that's why they didn't want these people to come over and they were just pleading. Oh, and they were just making promises like we will talk to the leaders of the uh, op opposing communities and we'll ensure your safety, which they were not able to because they had been trying it for two, three, four months. I, it, it's, uh, the violence broke out in March and it just continued till now. We reached 30th June, end of June and it was still continuing. Um, in Karachi also, we see the laborers striking, like in Bombay, we also see the laborers strike in Karachi and they were also against that bill uh, that was passed, the India, uh, the Industries Disputes Act, which was later known as, uh, and also they also wanted the, pay, uh, they wanted the payment commission that was set up and that gave an uh, increase and the basic uh, uh, bare minimum wage that gave, to, that gave it to the laborers, uh, they wanted those um, recommendations to be uh, imposed on the industries, but that wasn't happening. So that's why they, they were also striking. So we, yeah. And on the right hand, we have Chittagong Hill tracts and Pakistan. So what happened was Chittagong, of course, it went to Bangladesh then, but Chittagong has a 97% population that is non-Muslim. So now what the, the thing that happened was instead of Chittagong, uh, being decided on India between India and Pakistan, it was decided whether it will go to East Bengal or West Bengal. And of course, it was closer to East Bengal, so it went to East Bengal despite having a 97% population. But what the people wanted was the partition to be happened, not to join East Bengal or West Bengal, but to join India or Pakistan's dominions, which did not happen. And a 97% uh, non-Muslim majority area went to a Muslim majority country. Fascinating. Um, here we see that inflation is rising because food was also not just there was damage of property and people, but food was also uh, damaged. For example, in Amritsar, we have 2 lakh rupees worth of ajwain being just burnt like that. And this is not, not spices, also like basic um, wheat, rice, all these. Due to the rioting? Is it due yeah, to yeah, the rioting? Yeah, yeah, during the rioting because some of these places were owned by People of the other, I'm using other just to yeah. differentiate, right? Now. People the of minority the other, region, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, whoever the, was the minority in the region, some of them were uh, owned by those go downs and everything, and they were burned down because they were people from the different community, and which also saw a rise in food prices. Of course, it would. And, and then, in a way, you you have to see like the rioters were hurting themselves because they were yeah. increasing their own food costs and depleting yeah. their own food supplies. And some of the looting, especially of food articles, can also be attributed to this burning of food, which in turn raised the prices and then they have no choice but to loot again food. Yeah. And um, in Calcutta, like you see, like such a small clipping of six people dying and 40 injured and bombs are used. This did this still did not find its place on the first page, but on fifth or sixth page. Uh, wow. Even bombs. So these were not just mobs. Also, there was also very targeted attacks. Uh, Definitely, that, that and and I'll yeah. tell you a little something. You know, I've interviewed people um, who actually talk about building bombs as part of their strategy. They actually talk about putting X's on houses that they plan to attack. Yeah. So we have interviewed people who did take part in the mobs at the time. They were younger, and they admit to being, you know, misled. Um, now they're much older and uh, it's just, I'm grateful to them for being able to share that with us because we need to know what was going on yeah. back then. Exactly. Um, and this is, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Th uh, this is after the partition of Bengal was finally finalized. So these, this is the then chief minister of Bengal, Suhara Vardhi and on, on Sohra Vardhi and Khwaja Nizamuddin are on the left and they were uh, on behalf of the Muslim League. And on right, you have D.N. Mukherjee and N.R. Sarkar who were representing the Congress and they find, there were also other officials, uh, some British officials also. Uh, for example, there's Mr. H.S.C. Stevens who was the Chief Secretary. Um, so they were also present and they were doing a meeting to decide how finally the partition of Bengal would be implemented. And finally, I found this little um, ad from a lamp company called Dipti. And uh, like the Mazdoor Raj that Mr. Jay Prakash was talking about, they also focus a lot on the peasants and their entire um, 
uh, ad campaign was just based on around peasants because of course lamp is also something that's uh, that is cheap and only people from like lower economic classes would be able to buy would buy others would go for fancy options and here there's a very nice little ad it's it's a really ad. interesting because i wonder if the people that this is targeted towards will even um you know get to see it and secondly i wonder if uh calling people peasants you know it, it, it's yeah. got derogatory <laughs> undertones to it i wonder i still wonder why that word is even used i mean it's very like upper class looking down upon you know people self uh i guess self described upper class looking down upon people who are working in the agricultural proletariat then yeah yeah so it's a very fascinating ad it's clearly not meant for the actual people that are going to be buying these supposedly yeah that very that interesting it. find yeah that was it for today well thank you so much fahad it looks like uh, that was the end of your slides that was a wonderful presentation and thank you to anshul on the back end who's been doing all the switching um to all our viewers you know we do this we're doing this every day from june 3rd through august 17th we're exploring the history of partition for 75 days um please join us every single day except sundays when we do take a break from this series and uh, you know join us again on i guess monday after this and if you like what we're doing definitely smash that like button uh if you're on youtube or facebook you can do that on facebook as well in fact facebook you can add other emotions as well and if you have you know um comments if you've got things that you want to learn more about post them in our comments because we will try to address um you know the questions that you have about partition through our speaker series and uh anyway and thank you also uh fahad for joining us and please you can provide feedback to fahad if there's more you want to know from him because he's going to be joining us about once a week going forward and um he can definitely try to incorporate some of your questions into his future presentations so thank, thank you, you again everyone and uh, we will see you next week